am um, Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson, and I am the CEO and founder of Judas Roar Domestic Violence Awareness Initiative. Our entire focus and purpose is to ignite hearts, inspire minds, and safeguard destinies as it pertains to domestic violence. We're calling this uh, domestic violence and, 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 and advocates' unique perspective, their unique vantage point. Now, some of us have history, personal histories of domestic violence, um, and we will share as much as we are comfortable sharing in a public forum. Um, others may not, but we're all passionate. We're all passionate. And what I'm excited about is the various vantage points. We are in different parts of the country. We approach this problem, this issue, this pandemic from a, our own unique perspective. And everything that each one of us does is important and impactful. So we have um, put together, pulled together, invited some some amazing, amazing DV advocates. Um, and we have a police officer on our illustrious panel. And so what we're gonna do is to have them to briefly introduce themselves so that you know who they are and why you should listen to them. Savan Walker is going to help us to moderate this today as well as Paris Gamble will also be assisting. Uh, you all feel free to share this on all of your social media platforms. I know that we're going to come away with some really powerful, impactful information, and I'm excited about what I expect to learn today um, as we do this. And so we're going to go to our um, moderator, Savannah Walker, and she will assist in having our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and say what they're doing and how you can contact them. Hi, everyone. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of such an amazing panel discussion concerning something that is prevalent in every each and every family. Um, and I'm so honored to be able to be with you all today. And I just want our, our guests who are prominent in their field and, and are experts on the things that are going on with domestic violence. If each of you would just give a brief introduction of yourself, um, of yourselves and any platforms you are, 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 are passionate about, any books, any kind of medium that you are responsible for getting the word out on how people can come out of domestic violence and lead a better life. We'll start with, with uh, Misty, would you please introduce yourself? Um, yes, <clears throat> my name is Misty Shavers. I am from Alabama and I am a domestic violence survivor and an advocate and a mentor and I'm also a podcaster. I, um, I also am a co-founder of a group called Man Up Movement. That is an initiative to help young men um, that are in sports or any type of, uh, you know, academic things um, <clears throat> to understand what domestic violence is in their community and some of the things that they can help, uh, you know, like awareness and maybe help victims or speak out, you know, and know their surroundings and know what they're looking at. And, you know, I think that it's a very important initiative. It's just started up this past year. Um, we've done some assemblies, we went and spoke. And um, so I'm excited about the new year that's coming um, because the pandemic uh, with the COVID has really put a damper on things, you know, because school closings and COVID and stuff. But um, this coming year, I hope to do big things with the Man Up Movement, get more people involved with the program because we would like for it to essentially um, not just be, you know, the man up movements per se, like talking to the young men in sports, we'd like to be able to reach everyone, you know, and even the young girls too, you know, it's important all children, in my opinion, start learning what this is in high school, so we can get a jump on things, because I was 18 years old when I experienced domestic violence, and I just feel like that it's extremely important for young people to know what this is and how they can do something to keep themselves safe 
from domestic violence. My name is Renanda Forney, and I'm an advocate for Harmony House Domestic Violence Shelter here in Georgia. Uh, one of my hats that I wear, and because of COVID, thank you for mentioning it, mentioning that, Misty. Uh, we've had, I'm a legal advocate. So what I do is I assist in protective orders. And I've been with Harmony House for the last four plus years. I started off two years before, prior as a volunteer. This is uh, so passionate for me because I'm a survivor of domestic violence. And through my experience, uh, God had led me to write Arthur three books. The first one was in 2002 called Bruised, Broken, and Healed. And then um, I did a daily bread called Give Us This Day. And you can get this on Amazon. This is a devotional. It is not just geared towards women. It just um, is for anybody. But I think having a piece of information that we can go to every day for encouragement, especially a lot of people feel as if they need um, they're by themselves, especially going through domestic violence situation. Uh, I also just recently in March of 2020 released proof. And that's basically my testimony, uh, sharing the things that I've gone through and um, shared how God have kept me even through that and how we all can be a testimony and, and share with other people that you can make and you are a survivor and we can't give up. And um, it might not be easy, but with God, all things are possible. Um, so being a legal advocate, uh, safety planning with any and every individual is so important because they need to know that they can get out, they can survive. And uh, sometimes not saying anything is really detrimental. So I'm honored to be on this panel. Thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. I am the CEO and founder of Safe and Harm's Way. So I am a survivor of domestic violence myself. So I started Safe and Harm's Way with the firm belief that I never wanted another woman to feel alone in this journey. And I speak from the feminine perspective because I am a girl, but I do realize that men can have abuse issued against them as well. So we know that statistically, the World Health Organization calls domestic violence an epidemic. We know how often it's reported statistically by men and women, but when you factor in shame, uh, those numbers are way higher because people are not gonna raise their hand and say, oh yeah, this, this is me. So the fact that we're talking about it today is amazing because we can um, take away that shame. And that's what we work for at Safe and Harm's Way. We want to give folks the tools for whatever lane they're in, in their survival highway, right? If they are just discovering that what they've been living with was abuse, they couldn't label it, just knew the relationship was horrible, or they know what it is and they can't yet escape, or they're in the process of escaping, which we all know is the most dangerous time for any survivor to try to leave. And then what are they doing after when they've, when they've gone because it's a lifelong journey of healing. So um, Safe and Harm's Way is on every social media. We are on Facebook, we are on LinkedIn, we are on Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and YouTube. Uh, so we can connect in any way we can for survivors. And um, that's, that's the journey we're on. I have a book launching in the first part of spring of 2021, which is focuses on just one part of abuse um, and sheds the light on that abuse using confidence and using the patience to tell your story when it's appropriate and always speaking the truth. So taking those same tentacles today of confidence, patience, and the truth into this discussion. Again, thank you, Cheryl, for having me and everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to meet you. Uh, my name is Dwayne Erson. Uh, I'm currently an officer in St. Louis, Missouri for North County Co-op. I've been in law enforcement for at least 30 years. And I'm excited to be on this panel uh, to hear uh, the experiences and, and what uh, the young ladies, the ladies uh, who have been through abuse and everything feel, but um, I'm happy to give you uh, my opinion on how a law, officer, a law officer feels about domestic violence or how it affects a, a law enforcement officer. Also to help uh, young men and, and, and males to understand how it occurs and how it affects uh, and then I would like on the panel to uh, 
get the feeling on how the police and how law handles domestic violence. Uh, uh, I've been, uh, uh, I just became a deacon maybe five years ago at my church and uh, all my life I have been uh, in the protective business through the military and through law enforcement. And now uh, I'm in the, protect, in the protective business of providing hope and, and encouragement for yes, God's sir. people as far as having the domestic violence and other things that are concerned with police officers in the world. And I'm excited and thank you for inviting me on your panel, Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you for, for inviting me to be a part of this as well. I'm honored to be with such um, greatness in the, in the work that we're doing. So um, my name is Michelle Bedingfield. I work with Harmony House Domestic Violence Shelter. We are a program um, based in Georgia, but we serve victims from all across Georgia and, and the United States. So. Um, I've been doing this work for about 14 years. Um, it's my the staff that works alongside of me that does the hand-to-hand, -hand, boots on the ground kind of work. And then um, one of my main roles is to go out and bring awareness and to bring um, insight to the work that you know that's being done around domestic violence. I work with training. I go into different uh, businesses and go to employers. We do a lot with uh, workplace violence human trafficking, sexual assault in the workplace. We do trainings to law enforcement officers. So um, thank you, Dwayne, for what you do. I know that's a um, such an important role that you play. And I know domestic violence is one of the most dangerous calls that you guys go on. So thank you for being the voice around domestic violence. So training law enforcement officers um, as to what it looks like and, and, and recognizing that there is a lot of frustration when they go back on that same call day after day after day and she continues to go back and um we do a lot of, of training to the um, our faith community um right bringing awareness to the to the to the faith community that that domestic violence is happening in that congregation and it is happening um to the men and to the women and to the children and just letting them know that there are resources and places that they can reach out to so the program that we have is a shelter so it's a 24-hour day seven day a week shelter um, but we recognize that a lot of people don't want to come into the shelter only they may need help before they leave as caroline mentioned the leaving is the most dangerous part so working with them on how they can leave safely we also recognize that after they leave and they find that courage and after they've transitioned out of the shelter they still might need some support so we have an outreach program that works with them to continue to help them to thrive while they're becoming that survivor we work with teen dating violence so um, thank you, Misty, for what you do for the empowerment of your young men. That is so important. And we want to go into the school systems and educate teens how to recognize those red flags. Because as all, all of you know here, it's not that teenager that's going to recognize that they're in the abusive relationship. It's going to be them recognizing it in their friend. So how do you say that? And it's empowering them to say something. Um, and, and then the last piece we do is sexual assault. We realized that 80% of our domestic violence victims had been sexually assaulted. And so we put that hat on. And so now Harmony House works with sexual assault victims and we meet them where they are. It might be three or four years later after the assault and it's to get their head back in the, in the real world and figure out how to move past that trauma. Or it could be the episode that happened last night and, and it's staying with them through the SANE exam and then going through the ju judicial system. So four hats, outreach shelter, teen dating violence, and then, um, sexual assault and Harmony House does it with lots of help from the community. So thank you for helping us bring awareness. Just one more avenue through Facebook and through Instagram is how we can be reached out at harmonyhousega.org. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Alexander, and I'm the founder and executive director of Stand Up Survivor. And we are based here in Orlando, Florida. Um, although we're local, we do have a global reach. We reach over a million people a month with domestic violence education, prevention, and awareness. And as a survivor myself in my first marriage, my, my, I just started using my voice, and I realized that as I used my voice, I was freeing other people to use their voice. And hence, that's where Stand Up Survivor started in 2015. We have an amazing board here, clinical director team that we work with survivors here and around the world, just focusing on making sure that um, you, can't, you can't prevent something if you don't even know that it's happening. Um, and so our goal is to make sure that we don't just help people survive, but to focus on thriving after. Um, a little bit like Michelle said, like they're out of it, but they don't even know that their life continues to exist. And we want to help them get back in the game um, and really begin to live. 
Um, and I also have Lisa Nicole Publishing where we help survivors or survivors or anybody really share their stories, bring their stories to life. Um, people that desire to, I love to see people find their voice, put it on paper and help others do the same through that as well. Um, and so I have several books that I've done most recently is a healing journey, Heal, healing journal, which helps people process the trauma and stuff that they've been through. Uh, we do different things here. We have a retreat for survivors. We have our No Survivor Left Behind program where we focus on male survivors of domestic violence as well as um, those in the LGBTQ plus community. We have multiple programs that we help to make sure that we know that domestic violence does not discriminate and neither do we. We wanna make sure that everyone feels a sense of safety and love. And like you guys talked about, there's different avenues from young people to children that are impacted from domestic violence. And again, if we don't talk about it, then people can't get help for it, so. Excited, of course, as Cheryl invited uh, Stand Up Survivor to be a part again. So excited to be here. So looking forward to this. My name is Karis Gamble, and I'm a recent graduate of Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau. Um, now I am a web producer at Fox 2 News in St. Louis. Um, I, my major and my degree is in multimedia journalism. So I'm into that sort of thing. And I'm just excited to see what's to come. Um, this is my first domestic violence really talk, like my first talk about domestic violence. We had a little bit um, of talks about it in school, but um, I'm excited to learn and to ask questions if I have them and just to see what all is gonna be said. Thank you, everyone. We'll move on to um, our question. When it's more than seven, seven is just an average. How as advocates do, do you all deal with pouring into, as Renanda just described, as I know Lisa does, as, as you do, Carolyn, as we all do, as Misty does, you know, we work really hard and we put all of our heart into it because we understand how debilitating it is and how hopeless they can feel. How do you handle it when they do go back? Honestly, because so here's the thing, advocates, and I, and I want survivors and victims to understand that we're people too. We are people too. And so when you pour all your heart into something, okay, the Bible says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And so we, we treasure each individual life that crosses our path, especially if it's being subjected to this. So how do you deal with it at your address, at your house, after hours, right? Going back to your life and your kids and your fur babies and your other responsibilities, when you've poured into this individual, and they do okay for a while, and then they go back. What is your internal conversation? I, have I can answer that. Dialogue, okay. Um, first, I'm going to say that I'm passionate, and that I'm gonna say I'm gonna answer the other question real quick. Um, I'm very passionate, and um, the reason is because I survived domestic violence. And it's because I got out while the getting was good. And uh, it took one person to say one thing to me that changed my whole, my whole thinking, my whole way of thinking. And that one moment, even though I was severely scared and frightened of what was going to happen, I still, that, that little voice in my head caused me to get help. Mm -hmm. So later on in life, when I figured out what my purpose was and what God wanted me to do, to help other women, I knew that it was my job to be that voice because a lot, so many women are so scared to speak up because of the volatile situations that they're in with these dangerous men. Um, because we, as we know, there a lot of them are just severely dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so my passion is because of that. And that's what keeps me driven. Um, and now I'm going to answer what you said, Cheryl. Um, <clears throat> Whenever this happens, I, I left so many times and went back, you know, I did. And it was that voice and it took a very long time for me to actually get up the courage to actually leave. So if I deal with someone that's going through that and, you know, and you do pour your heart and soul and your time and your effort and your energy um, and it's a relentless thing. And I don't really think that people understand what advocates really do go through. Uh, you know, my phone stays open. My messenger is constantly open. I'm a part of 200 groups on Facebook. Um, you know, I have a podcast that's 14K uh, listeners. 
So, I mean, I, I've got a lot. The community I live in, it's a small royal community. Um, women don't speak out as much here as I would like. I don't get enough feedback in my own community like I would really like here because I can say there were arrest reports, domestic violence, this and this and this. Um, but I decompress. I decompress. I pray about it. I hand it to God and my phone does not go closed. I don't, I don't stop talking to that person. I give them time and space. Mm -hmm. um, I stay in a mutual contact. It may be from afar, but they know I'm there in the background. They know that I've not left them and I'm not going to, but I decompress and I let my energy, I, I meditate and I get my mind right and I get myself back into working energy order, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we have to take a little downtime, you know, yes. but I'm all, my phone is always open. It's never closed. Um, my messenger's never closed. So, I mean, messages sometimes pour in. Sometimes I get phone calls. I've gotten phone calls in the middle of the night. Um, you know, so, you know, I just, that's what I do. You know, I don't know if that was the correct answer for that, but it's something that I do, you know, but, you know, and I'm spiritual, so I take it to the Lord, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I go from there with what I feel like I need to do next and, and to, to help this person. And there's been moments where I have to send um, victims or survivors to other advocates. Maybe I'm not the right advocate for her. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm not in her city. Yeah. Maybe I don't have the connections she needs. So I give out information. Um, I do it on my podcast. That is a big thing for me is information and networking. And to me, this panel is brilliant because we are all in different spots. We all kind of do the same thing, but a little different. But we are all connected in the same um, passion. Uh, this is our passion to get women to safety and to get men to safety. So, you know, we are all doing the same work, essentially. Just following up to, you know, you know, your question was, um, how do how do we handle it when they knowing that they're going to go back seven times um, or up to they could sometimes more? Um, you know, the biggest thing I would tell someone is if if we, we all get it, the ones on this panel get it. But if there's someone out there listening that doesn't work with this day by day and it's their next door neighbor or their sister or their coworker, and you've been working with them, the biggest advice I could give to someone is just to validate that that you care about them. Yes. Um, give them those words of encouragement. But we have to accept the fact that they know their partner better than we do. And they have to know why they're going back. And to say, you can't go back. You look how far you've come. That's taken that power away. We're not any different from him saying, you can't make it without me. So... Mm -hmm. Um, the biggest thing I could do is tell, tell someone to reach out to one of these advocates that's on this station right now, um, call someone and figure out how to do a safety plan. I mean, you could probably Google safety plans. If they're going to go back, validate that you hear them, validate that you don't think it's the best thing for them at all, that you're really honestly concerned about them and their well-being. Mm -hmm. Share with them that there are other choices. But ultimately, if that's the decision that person's going to make, do a safety plan and everything down to where's the key, where's the money, where's the change of clothes, what can I hold for you, what can I put in a safety deposit box, what can I ship to someone else outside of another state. Mm -hmm. I mean, get that safety plan together and then as an advocate, self-care. Um, Misty, I heard you say that your phone is 24-7. I'll tell you what, I would go nuts if my staff had a 24-7 phone. It's, but it's what works for you. You'd probably go there if you didn't have it. But self-care is so important. I joke and say a lot of times that people that don't get counseling are the crazy ones. If an advocate needs someone to deprocess through and to, to talk this out with, whether it's someone in your in the faith community, whether it's a licensed counselor, whether it's just your best friend that you honestly trust and has signed a confidentiality form there's got to be someone that you can talk it through and practice that self-care, whether it's to exercise, like with the devotions that Renanda wrote, whether it's um, meditation, whether it's yoga, whether it's going to the gym and punching it out in a punching bag, you know, just find a way to do some self-care as an advocate because those clients are going to go back and 
if you keep it all and you keep it on and it's your fault and you store it in, it's not healthy. No, no. Hey, I actually have a question. <clears throat> it's Karis, yeah. Um, so I was going to ask, what do you guys do when you know that there are survivors that will be going back and forth? Um, but also, do they ever get um, frustrated or feel like they're letting you guys as advocates down and if it ever does get that way what do you guys do to help them to know like it's okay you know you did it or you're going to do it like what do you guys do or say to them one of the things for me I I, I would do a safety plan with them I will let them know make a copy of your, of your w-2s um or your last year tax returns or a few years. I'll also tell them to um, have some money stashed somewhere. Mm -hmm. I will also tell them to do a safety word with your neighbor, with a yeah. plan with your kids, uh, with someone that you can trust. Uh, if it's peanut butter, you know when, when you, I, you see the word peanut butter text or call and I say peanut butter, then you know to call 911 to have them to come to the house. Uh, yeah. And sometimes without the without a siren on, um, I will also encourage them. For me, because it is disheartening sometimes, just to be honest. Mm -hmm. and, and even when you know, but it's that's not my job because I left over seven times and I went back. So I have to remind myself, Fernanda, uh, uh, you 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 wasn't perfect. You did this. So I have to in their face. I'm encouraging them because yeah. somebody yeah. needs to build them up because right, they've been right. torn down. So in their face, I encourage them. In their face, I give them a safety plan. In their face, I tell them to have your ducks in a row, money stash, a, a, a change of clothes somewhere, even if it's by the tire, where they put the tire in the car, uh, uh, inside of their trunk. I tell them to keep a spare something at their friend's house or at their neighbor's. Have your birth certificate, your social security cards, things that you're going to need for tomorrow. But behind their back, I'm praying. Yes. yes. And even if I have to go home and take a shower and tears running down my face, yes. they will not see that because I want to encourage them to build them up so they can be know who they are to a certain degree. And even in the in Bible says one planet, one water, but it's God that gets the increase. And I'm going to forever pray for them. Even if I forget their names, I'm still lifting up uh, survivors of domestic violence. Yeah, and I'd like to piggyback on Rolanda's uh, safety plan and everything. Uh, that was my goal when I met people that, uh, victims that would go back and forth. Uh, you know, uh, I talked to Shira earlier when she was talking to me and, and you know, the plan is important, secret words. Uh, have an address that your spouse don't know nothing about. Get in mm -hmm. touch with your neighbors. Get their phone numbers. Give them a password. Uh, I agree on all that. You know, have 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 a plan, uh, a backup system. Uh, because uh, I, I had one victim. I would meet her at the grocery store, and I would ask her how she was doing because. Us being officers, if we come by the house a lot of times, the abuser will feel like oh, uh, she's she's giving information to him. They, they're trying to set me up or, you know, she's planning to leave. So uh, being an officer, I had to work around a lot of things. And then I had to also get them to trust me. It's how I speak to them. Because most of us are like Robocops. We, you know, we, we, when we come and we talk, we talk with you do this, you do that. You know, uh, uh, my wife helps me a lot because she's a she works with a lot of sheltered women, abusive women, uh, and she just graduated from being a life coach. And uh, I learned a lot of things from her as far as uh, being directive and how to talk to women. But it, it, it's uh, as far as making a plan, knowing your resources, who to call. Uh, you can even have a neighbor call the officer. Uh, and I do agree a lot of officers don't know that on a domestic call, most of us have our sirens going. That's like a alarm saying, hey, you, you call the police, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Usually I would go with silent with my lights off and everything. 
Uh, but uh, it's, 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 to me, I feel like I'm not doing enough. It's like, I got my hands tied. I'm, I'm talking to this individual. I, I used to get frustrated, but then I, I, I just pray on the God and, and, and prayer helps a lot. Uh, when I see him, and, you know, I can't really ask them what's going on, but, you know, when we talk, I say, well, you know, nod your head or make a little sign or something. Let me know you're doing all right. Uh, that was real important to me. Uh, and and, and I, I just love hearing the, the, the information that I'm getting because it helps me out a lot. I'm writing a lot of things down of what y'all are saying. So I appreciate it. The survivor has a, a lot on their plate anyway. The victim, survivor, whatever, whatever however you're labeled, they have a lot on their plate. So we, our goal as advocates is never to let them feel guilty. That's not it. Because we've been there. We've walked that yeah. road. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to have control of their decisions that they make. And whether it's to go back or not, we want to let them know that, that that's in your power and your control to make that decision. Would it be our advice? Of course not. Because we know how mm -hmm. deadly domestic violence is. You know, And so for us, it's just to make sure that we're there to support them, you know, and I love what Misty said. We're definitely 24 uh, seven. We learn to self care, but we want to make sure that if you call at three o'clock in the morning, whether it's chaos yeah. or not, that we're there to help support you, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So that we can get to them. And a lot of times they're trauma bonded, you know, to the, oh, yeah. so no matter your voice of reason mm -hmm. that you're giving them, it's not as powerful as the voice that they hear. I'm sorry. I love you. Come back. The kids mm -hmm. or family, right. their voice is always they're going to true. be louder until we start yes. giving them their, they get their power back and start hearing their voice and the truth of who they are uh, and they start to get their power back and so whether it's the decision to stay or leave we're still going to be here for you we still support yes. you because imagine if that one time we give up on them is the one time they're actually ready yes. to leave for yes. the last time yes. with the survivor i've noticed this and i'll just say this if i usually have victims that go back nine times out of ten they're trauma bonded yes. they cut off they cut me off at the path they cut me off because they're still in denial. They st they, they're not in denial. Of, I mean, they know that they're being abused, but they have that trauma bond. They're listening to him. Oh, baby, I love you. I'll never do it again. It's never going to happen again. So they don't want the help of an advocate. They fly away from you. You know right. what I mean? I've had right. several fly away from me that, have, that I, I'm still, I still see, but I can still see what's going on. If that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I think so. that the, the trauma bonding, you know, is, is, and I'm glad that, that you all brought this up because oftentimes what people don't understand. And I think we need to remind ourselves that the brain is actually rewired because of trauma. So it's not about intelligence. It's not about even really self-esteem. It's, 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 it's the brain is not functioning the way it was intended to function because of the ongoing trauma. And the volume of the brain literally changes. Like if you could take your brain out and weigh it, it would weigh one thing pre-trauma and it will weigh a lot less post-trauma. And so you literally have less to work with and it affects your ability to, to make sound decisions. It affects your ability to even trust your own judgment. It, it reinforces what the, what the abuser is saying to you right? Because you can't think properly. And so the, the analogy that I use as a yardstick, if you have a yardstick and you know it's supposed to be, you know, three feet is a yard. If you've experienced trauma, your yardstick is not three feet. Your yardstick might be two feet. But our hope is not lost because if you recognize that your yardstick is only two feet, you can compensate for that missing one foot. You can look at a situation and say, this is how it looks to me and that's probably not accurate because of what I've been through. So who can I talk to that can help me to balance this out? You know, And so I think if, if victims and advocates, if we can just remember that it's not an intentional letting us down, it's not an intentional even letting themselves down, that the brain is a hot mess, all right? I was going through some boxes now I'm really getting ready to be transparent now for real. I was going through some boxes a few weeks ago that I had not opened since 1990. I didn't know what was in these boxes. I'm appalled at how many times I went to court. Didn't even remember that I had done all of that that many times. 
that many times. I was in the garage by myself being embarrassed. I'm like, oh my God. And you know, you know, in the court orders, they say exactly what happened. And I'm thinking, and I dropped the charge for what reason? I mean, it was to me, it was just a, a glaring example. Like I'm I'm appalled thinking about it now. <laughs> Look back, I'm thinking, I cannot believe that I stayed on that hamster wheel that many times when reading exactly what happened in the case. And so that's the way it is. And you can't see it at that time. And sometime even afterwards, because I didn't have any real knowledge, you know, that I had done that that many times. I know it was a come and go thing. I had no idea it was that many times until I saw the documentation. And I thought, oh my God, this is something else. Okay. So for, for me, and, and I'm somewhere between Michelle and Misty with the whole phone thing. Okay. So I'm like, I'm, I'm in the middle of the continuum because I've always been a therapist and then I was a military commander. I, I always had to be wide open 24 seven, 24 seven. I've done that for years. That'll burn you out though. That'll, that'll burn you out. It will affect the quality of your life. And so we have to understand that we can't be there for everybody. It, it'll make you sick over time. It really will make you sick. And so what I've done is I've discovered the do not disturb on my phone. I discovered that. And I said it later than the average person would be available, like 11, 11.30. And I'd leave it on until a reasonable time the next morning. And then I check my notifications if I happen to still be up, but at least I'm not being awakened out of a sound sleep. The other thing that I do for self-care is I kickbox. I'm not talking about Tai Bo. I'm not talking about punching the air. I'm talking about punching a heavy bag and kicking a heavy bag. It's what I literally love to do. I do that and I hike. I hike cliffs. I hike wherever I can hike. And that's how I decompress. And I allow myself at least an hour a day to do that. It's, this, it's an appointment with myself. Okay, it is five o'clock. I'm hitting the trail. It won't be dark until six. I'm getting this walk in. And I had to learn to do that because otherwise we can't be our best if we're exhausted. And, and, then, and then my self-talk is this, when it comes to people coming and going, to victims going back or whatever, that it's important to respect their decision and to respect where they are in their process. And so, you know, what I would say to a victim, I had someone say to me a few weeks ago, well, you know, he strangled me and then, you know, I called the police and then he went to jail, but I don't want to press charges and they're not listening to me and, and this and that and the other. Um, and then she said, well, can you help me bail him out? Absolutely not. No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. If you need groceries, I'll help you with that. But I'm not going to help you get him out. And the reason I'm not going to help you get him out is because you are seven times more likely now that he's placed his hands around your neck. You are seven times more likely to be killed by that same person. And I can't help you do that. I'm, I won't help you do that. You need a bus ticket. You need a plane ticket. You know, some other way I can help you. But bailing him out? No, no, ma'am. No, I cannot do that. So we have to have boundaries in place. Because at the end of the day, we, you want to be able to live with whatever happens, whatever they choose to do. All right, did I say to you, I really hope that you don't go back. I think you don't deserve this. And there are other options and there's help out here. If I said all of those things, it makes it easier for me to respect their decision. Right? And if we don't, then we're... And, and, I, and I think it was Carolyn that said it, if we, if we don't, or if we make them feel guilty about it, then we're no different than the person that's abusing them. We're telling them that they are not capable of deciding what is best for themselves. Right. Right. And that's who we don't want to be for sure. We don't right. want to be that person. We don't want to be that person. So.